that much space. Otherwise, okay, we are live. Good afternoon and welcome to a Friday afternoon live stream. It's been a couple of weeks. Understandably, we took a little break. Thank you, everyone who's here already and that has joined us. Um, <laughs> Hello. <laughs> There's Con. He's here. Uh, in terms of setup, I hope that syncing wise and everything, it all sounds and looks good. We've uh, we've moved the equipment around a little bit, so fingers crossed it's all working as it's supposed to. I'm still waiting for it to load up on my screen, mm. so I have no idea. Um, I haven't done my hair. You haven't done. <laughs> you missed that. What were you doing all this time? Dressing up in black. Uh, understandably, it is a very strange time in London at the moment, and uh, to be honest, we've got so many wonderful viewers from all over the world. It seemed a bit odd not to to pay our respects yeah. and to do it in a way which uh, we find fitting, which is uh, celebrating the Queen's wonderful life, but also the fact that she was an avid photographer, uh, which although she wasn't a Nikon user, is very in keeping with uh, with what we like to sort of spread the message on. Photography kind of connects us all, I think. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just sort of, sort of seeing this big yellow banner on I know, things. So I it's know. a bit alarming, like, oh no. Well, hope you can hear us okay. And uh, yeah, if you can't, then do let us know in the comments. Exactly. Well, Sam can hear us because she said it's all good. She had her equipment moved around as well. Um, so We're in okay. sync. Uh, yeah, so she knows yeah. how we feel. Yeah. Um, and thank you very much to Marvel for your contribution you, to the Earl Grey Tea Fund, as uh, Dixon renamed it for today. Yeah. Now, um, it's really, really interesting. London is a really strange place to be in at the moment. We are in, obviously, in the borough of Westminster, so we're sort of smack bang in the middle of it all. We've got road closures and, and a large quantity of people coming through. Um, we had the very lovely Alan come to see us earlier. He had actually just been down to Green Park to look at all of the flowers that had been laid out. And possibly the most British thing ever, um, there was a, a reporter that said, please, no more marmalade sandwiches and Paddington bears, but please feel free to bring flowers. So that's true. In true British style, for those of you that missed it during the, the Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebration, she did uh, a short film with Paddington Bear and uh, pulled yeah. the marmalade sandwich out of her yeah. handbag because she had the most wonderful sense of humor. That's true. And then the most British thing is standing in line in the queue. We now probably have the longest queue in the world. That's right. And that's what you British all been waiting for and prepared for. That's so, right. This yeah. is like the Olympics. Of this queuing. is the one. Um, so it's like eight to 10 hours now to queue up to pay your Absolutely. respects. I, th I think, you know, I think the queen would appreciate that. I think, you know, with her sense of humor, you know, I yeah. think she would appreciate that. She would have appreciated it very much. And uh, yes, anyway, so we're going to talk about her photography uh, a little bit. Obviously, no one's ever seen her pictures, which uh, I do hope that one day we will mm. get the chance to. And if you have any stories you'd like to share, please do share them in the comments, yeah. in the chat. We would love to read them out. Have and you met the Queen? Yeah. Well, Maybe not like shaking hairs, but you know, have you seen her? Yeah, I yeah. actually, John, um, John Hughes, who's obviously, who's a very welcome contributor every week, uh, said that um, that his sister and his mother went to the Queen's coronation rehearsal. Wow! Because um, his father worked on the BBC, mm. so I thought that was very, very that's nice, very, very nice, um, and. I personally don't actually have any stories. I never met Her Majesty, but I think, I mean. I do. I obviously, I, I grew up in Kensington. So yeah. I, there were times when I thought maybe she was in a car or a vehicle. We often had the road closures. Well, I'm sure I you never, saw like Boris on the bike, you know, when he was a mayor. Saw, saw Boris on the yeah. bike a couple of times, you yeah. Know. Uh, around that way and also around the city of London where I've yeah. been quite a lot. But I never had a story of, of actually meeting her, which is a shame. Um, but how about you? You had a. I do, I do. You have a. Well, I've like I've seen her twice. The first one is not that important. It was Jubilee, not the this year's Jubilee, but the one ten years ago. Oh yeah, Di so diamond on the boat. So you know that's you know from the bank. That's fine. But the last one, last time, the second time I've seen her, it actually was literally almost on that distance. I'll tell you why. About three or four years ago, I had my driving lessons because mm -hmm. I lived in London, never had to drive. You know because obviously we have good connections here. And then suddenly I was like, okay, I'm going to move out, you know, to suburbs. I need to learn how to drive the car. So I was living in Batsy. Um, I had my lessons around Vauxhall area, Albert Bridge and Westminster. Yeah. So 
I'm in a car driving across the Alder Bridge and we stopped in traffic light right on Alder Bridge. And we standed for about a minute and a second. I was like, well, that's strange. Traffic light doesn't go green. Mm. And then I see two motorcycles passing by. And then there's a Rolls Royce. And it's a nice one because the windows were massive. And I'm in the driving seat here. She's passing in, that, in the next lane. She's there. Yeah. <laughs> and I was standing to my, you know, instructor driving driver, like, is that the queen? I was like, yeah, yeah, I see her all the time. Wow. So that was, that was incredible. Obviously, it's made my day and it's just, yeah, it's a nice memory to have. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I don't see, I don't have anything quite as cool as that, but it's nice to, it wasn't during your driving test though, it was during a lesson. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I failed. Um, no, but it, it was, it was so strange. It's strange. It's uh, for about a week I was buzzing because obviously I didn't expect that. No. And just having, I, I can tell you like where I'm from, yeah, yeah they block the whole city. Like they, wow. they basically block the highways and people waiting like for two hours in line. And they're going to have like 10 cars at the front, all, you know, bulletproof and everything, you know, and 10 uh, car, uh, you know, uh, cars at the back. Yeah. And here just having two motorcycle drivers, police drivers at the front. Yeah. And then two at the back and the car in the middle. And that's it. There's no security or anything else. I, I was quite surprised by that. Yeah. 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 It's uh, we don't kind of go over the over the top too much on it. Um, David asked, what is a jubilee? So that's a celebration of a, a period of time when a monarch has reigned for. So, for example, you would have after that. It's a bit like an anniversary of, mm -hmm. of when a monarch was crowned. So as as you've probably seen in the news, Queen Elizabeth II was the UK's longest reigning monarch in that she made it all the way to 70 years on the Yeah, throne. 70 years. It's incredible. Pretty phenomenal. Um, and whether you're interested in the royals or not, or, you know, whether you're a royalist or you don't like it, you know, the, ultimately she was, was an icon to, to many, many people and is on all of our currency and our post boxes and our stamps and, and everything. Yeah. So whether you're interested in it or not, this is uh, this is a person that we're going to talk about for for this afternoon, and also photography, just in general, and and cameras and yeah. things like that. And we're talking about seventy plus years, yeah. So she became a monarch when she was twenty five. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, it was a, a tough shoes to fill. Um, now, thank you to David for your contribution to thank the you, Earl Grey with Milk No Sugar. Fund. Thanks for your email as well last week. Yes, it was yeah. very, very much appreciated. We did have a lot of lovely emails. Obviously, we sent out a missive as well um, to everybody. And we will be closed for the bank holiday Monday, as most of the country will be, just for anyone who who is wondering or wants to pop in during the afternoon. We won't be open on Monday. Uh, Taddy has actually said that he, uh, he met her and... Uh, Queen's Consort, which is uh, was Prince Philip, sorry, let's get that right mm. there, in Leadenhall Market in the city a number of years ago, shared a pint with Charles bought by someone else. They were with us chatting for about 20 minutes. Incredible. Oh, my goodness. That's amazing. Um, and, yes, the Queen with the Paddington Bear video is very, very, uh, very, very <laughs> iconic. That one's going to go down in history, I think. Um, Sam said that she grew up and worked on a private estate belonging to one of Her Majesty the Queen's lady in waiting from the coronation as a baroness still sits in the House of Lords. There you go. Um, and thank you, Adrian, for joining us. Said uh, made it a bit late. That's no problem. No problem at all. Hello, Eves, as well. And hello to Eves, exactly. And hello to everyone else who said hello from all the various yeah. parts of the world that you're joining us from. Um, so we have a few pictures. Yes, we, we thought do. We would, we, did you put them in date order or anything? I don't know. No. No. <laughs> we but organized. Look, I mean, the first camera she had is the, what, the Kodak Brownie? Kodak Box Brownie, was yeah, it? Yeah, that's the one. So, do we have you a know, picture of I don't, but I will have in a second. So if you um, continue to entertain. Yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, acronym Photography did ask slightly on the side there, what did you think of the Nikon Europe video cleaning a sensor with compressed air? Oh, that's a no. That's I didn't a no. see it, but that is a big fat no-no from us. We we do not recommend that. So that seems a bit strange. Um, I'm going to have to go and look it up after the live stream, in fact, to find out why they would have recommended that. Uh, David asked, is it true that the Queen was actually German, not English? Okay, I don't know the heritage of wow. the royal family going back, but there there are German roots in there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, go, and uh, we're all from different parts. So I think part of my heritage yeah. is polish or something i'm from scotland you're actually originally from scotland yeah i'm about i'm almost 
I'm about 45% Welsh. <laughs> I know that much. I'm quite a lot of Welsh. Um, yeah, descended part German. Thanks, Roy. He's our um, royal historian for today. Mm. I'm ready for the first picture. <laughs> Uh, not the Queen Charles, Taddeus said. It was it was uh, Prince Charles. Um, apologies. Ah, because you said the king. I understand now because we have to remember to say King Charles. All right. So here is a box brownie. Obviously, this is not the Queen's box brownie. No. But it's there. So that was her first camera, you say. According to articles that we've read recently, that is um, that was actually her first camera. Now, Interestingly enough, photography in the royal family kind of goes back all the way to the dawn of photography when uh, Queen Victoria was on the throne. That was when daguerreotypes started to become a fairly popular thing. And there was a gentleman called, I think it was John Mayle. He was the, um, yes, it was Jen, John Mayle, who was the first official royal photographer. And I have a book at home, which I didn't think to bring in, but it actually has some pictures of Queen Victoria's children dressed up and things like that when they were much smaller, taken as daguerreotypes. So mm. photography, as soon as the dawn of photography kind of occurred in London, from then onwards we've had photographs of our monarchs. So um, it's interesting to kind of have that tie-in all the way through history. Um, well, the interesting fact that the box brownie was given by her father before the war. Oh, wow. That's lovely. Um, Seth is Did the camera turn off? King. Here we are. Sorry about that. Had some technical power issues <laughs> with the camera, with the streaming camera. But we're back. We're back. Yeah, Seth broke the stream. Exactly. He came and then the stream just exploded. How many commercials did you see? <laughs> During that time. Exactly. Probably none. We should be, be able to just cut to ads whenever we have a technical issue. Yeah. We're not actually... Nice little commercial. Yeah, commercial break. <laughs> uh, if we had a full studio, then somebody else could do that for us. But anyway... Uh, say la Okay, so we were talking about uh, cameras. cameras, so yes, for a change. Uh, so the Queen's first camera was yeah. the Kodak Box Brownie. Yeah, then she moved on to Rolly cameras. Then she moved on to Rolly. Do you have a picture of her? I do have Rolly? a picture of Rolly, prepared? yeah, okay. and it's a, it's a nice one. It's a gold Rolly 35. Oh, this one I love. So I... Don't you have one? I have a B35, Okay. which is a slightly cheaper version. It's not gold. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, it's not sort of one of the beautiful special edition ones. Mine doesn't have the dial on the front of the camera. It's actually you've got it. You've got um, the aperture is controlled around the lens, and then the shutter speed is set from the top. Mm -hmm. But there's it's very very basic. It's like a stripped down yeah. version. You can't really focus, isn't it? You have to kind of. Is there like a fo uh, focus distance markings on the lens? That's right. That's yeah. It. There's no through the viewfinder. It's it's a rangefinder camera, but, but it without the patch. But without the patch, mm -hmm. so you actually have to set the distance of your subject. And on the top, it's got feet, and on the bottom, it's got meters. On my version, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but that's. I mean, that's a beautiful looking camera, isn't it? The the gold one. Do you think the the leatherette on it is like they have with the Nikon gold cameras where they have that kind of snakeskin style leatherette on those mm -hmm. gold rollies. Is it the same? Could be, could be. I feel like I need to look at it up now, L uh, look at um, what it looks like. Adrian said we need more likes. We do. Please feel free to give the stream a like. Slightly odd uh, thing to mention yeah. at this point, but we're incredibly close to 15,000 subscribers. So if you're watching and you haven't subscribed please mm. do It'd be very much appreciated so yeah i had to put lucas on timeout uh we're not talking politics today we talk cameras and we're celebrating the person that's right so that's that's what's important that's right we all have can have different opinions on the monarchy itself totally. it's not about that today 
No, we are celebrating the life of an individual that, whether you like it or not, had a huge influence on the world at large. So yeah. um, the Rolly 35 in gold actually had this kind of brown leatherette. You can't see it from the picture of the queen that we're sharing here, but uh, it's it's a kind of brownish leatherette, which is, I think, quite classy, actually. Mm -hmm. Gold cameras sometimes work, they sometimes don't. you got more than one picture. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, there we go. There's another one. So that was obviously a favourite for a little while. Um, in all the pictures that we found, we haven't found a single digital image. That's true. Not taken of her, but her using digital cameras. Yeah. I mean, we're going to move on to Leica soon. Maybe, maybe she used Leica, but we don't know. We've seen her with film Leicas, that's for sure. Uh, yeah, digital Leica would have been... Um, Maybe what would what do you think if she used a digital Leica? What would it have been? Because she had her beloved M3, an M6. I haven't seen any others. Well, to be honest with you, her first Leica was given by the company to her. Yeah. So I think she would be given all of them. You know, so maybe yeah. it would be M11 now. One maybe, of each. maybe it would be M10R or something like you this. Know, you know, there are certain people um, in the world, and I think probably. Her Majesty is the only person who would get the new one automatically sent by the company if they knew that she used them. Mm -hmm. um, so that that is that is a definite possibility, actually, that she had it. Whether or not she used it is another matter. We know that um, Kate Middleton, she's an avid photographer. Mm -hmm. She's been seen using mostly Fujis, actually. I haven't seen that's true. I've else. seen her with uh... she had like a Fuji XT20 or something a couple of years back. Um, also an avid photographer, but her photographs have actually been seen and actually published by mm -hmm. newspapers, uh, mostly family snaps and stuff. I remember someone asking me if um, if we'd be interested in provide, selling her a Nikon, and I said, yes, absolutely, <laughs> but, <laughs> but she's a Fuji user. So if she ever decides that she would like a Nikon, then she's welcome at Grey's. That would be lovely. Um, Seth asked the important question, but what film was she favouring? That's a good question. No one saw the images that she took. Yeah. So we don't know. I really do wish, actually, that we could get some kind of an exhibition or something. I know that all those images are very personal, but she was photographing at public events. There's mm. probably some, maybe there are some out there that we don't know are actually hers. I have a feeling that she probably would favour Ilford films somehow because they were made in Great Britain. Yeah, you know. okay. Who knows? I maybe. Like uh, David suge suggested, can you imagine the event she was photographing? What a book that would make. That is very true. My goodness. And I think... We probably will never see something like a book of her photographs because no one would be willing to commercialize that. It would it's just not you can't really do that, if you know what I mean. But um but it would be a fascinating thing to see, for sure. Um Roy has all the fun facts today, said uh she was the first head of state to send an email. Hmm. That's interesting. For anyone who's watched The Crown, not that I've watched all of it, but that big box that she would have to look, go through all the letters yeah. each day, that uh, really made me feel very sorry. You for know, her. I need to watch the whole thing, actually, because I watched the, the last season about Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. And I think I saw a couple of episodes of Winston Churchill, but I haven't seen the episodes one, one, two, there. three. So. Oh, I have, I've only yeah. seen the first season and I thought it was brilliant. And, you know, they filmed a lot around London. The Batsy Park was used quite a lot yeah. as well. So it's, yeah, I definitely, I think... You know, I mean, people have different opinions on The Crown. Of you course. Know, but I think it's important television. Whether, whether whether it's, you know, it's not necessarily, a, it's not a biography, as no. it were. But it's kind of interesting, particularly if you're of our age where we didn't grow up around those events happening and you kind of get a bit of insight. I remember my grandmother saying, oh, I remember when that happened. She wasn't a, an avid watcher or anything, but she said, I remember when the fog happened in London for mm. example, and, and things like that. Um, so, so it is kind of interesting to see what your maybe older relatives experienced if you weren't around during that time. Um, thank you very much, Terry, for your contribution. Thank you, Terry. To raise a glass to the Queen. I think that's wonderful. Um, David or Dixon said, I would like to see footage of her fixing cars. Did she ever, um, did she ever do? I'm like, sure she can do that. I'm sure, I mean, yeah. woman of many talents, but yeah, it's, uh, it's quite possible. Um, I don't think she would have had to get accredited to shoot events. I think she would have been allowed to bring her camera regardless. In fact, I remember reading an article during the Platinum Jubilee, which was, you know, 
things you wouldn't expect the queen to have in her handbag and a camera was one of them mm. but she would bring one everywhere she yeah. went yeah. um so what was the next camera that we had so we've seen her rolly did yes. we show her rolly uh, we did, okay. we did. So, well, actually, we didn't show the other rolly that she used. Because she had so, a TLR yeah. as yeah, well, Yeah, so didn't she? she used some of those as well. So let's find that image. And uh, here she we is. We were somewhat prepared. <laughs> sort of. And then I'm DJing now. Boom. Just like that. So that's, uh, yeah, that's the image on the front cover of, of our stream. That's her carrying uh, some form of rolly flex, twin lens reflex. Um, I, unfortunately, I'm not au fait with the models. But if you do know, if you're one of those people that can identify cameras just from a profile shot like that or you're familiar with it, please feel free to speak up in the chat. Yeah. We would massively appreciate it. Well, I assume it's uh, medium format and six by six. Yeah. Yeah, I would obviously, yeah, I would assume so too. In fact, when I was researching which medium format camera to purchase, Mm. I did look at some of the older TLRs because they were a bit cheaper. Yeah, did you see uh, Queen's review of uh, Rolly Flex I TLR? I did not. Okay. <laughs> she did not supply a review. It was a shame. Um, she was, oh, that's right. Michael said she was in the army during World War II fixing mm. vehicles. I had I knew that and didn't had forgotten that, filed that away. But it's quite, I wonder, there's probably some surviving pictures uh, around. Uh, Tom says there were some photos of her doing it. It was good PR during the war. Um, and John never liked using TLRs, but yes, they were 120 style. They were, mm. one, sorry, 120 film. So she, so we know she shot with 120 film because of the cameras. There was more than one picture of her using a rolly, was there not? No, no well, we have, uh, we have cine cameras. Oh, yes. We do have cine you cameras. pop up the cine camera one. Yeah, let's There's have a look. at least one of those. Yeah, one of those. It was those. like a 16 millimeter... Kodak. Kodak. Yeah. And we also have another camera, which we don't know of, but uh, it could be, I don't know, maybe Bolex, maybe Kodak. It could maybe be. Maybe some of you can recognize that camera. I'm going to uh, switch to it in the, well, now. Right now. There you go. Now, interestingly enough, there was something a, f a little while ago saying, you know, unseen footage of, um, of some s cine stuff that she had well shot. there's a bbc documentary about her it's called right. unseen queen and they they yeah they use some of that footage that you've taken with those cameras it's on bbc if you have a tv license you can go to iplayer website and uh, and watch it yeah nice um william says payload bolex mm. thank you i thought it was bolex yeah points to you um you know i was watching a documentary uh very recently about uh, the developments and failure of digital bolex camera no, really? Yeah, which um, it wasn't true Bolex camera, they used the name, but it w they were trying to make the new digital Bolex basically very similar to the old ones and the story about that. So have a look at this on YouTube somewhere. Yeah, um, there's definitely uh, a lot of love for the 120 film. I mean, as you know, if you would have seen our um, our video from a few weeks back, I guess it was, mm -hmm. we're also lovers of medium format. Um, yeah, I mean, if you shoot film nowadays, especially color, it seems like the only there's no 35 mil film available, um, and then there's plenty of 120. So if you want to shoot film, I think 120 at the moment. Well, it's not been the most the cheapest option, but uh, it is available at least. Is is the way to go? Uh, yeah, Jim said the, there was an archive of cine film uh, shown on TV from from her cine shooting days. Uh, I actually haven't seen that. I feel like I'm kind of missing out. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that documentary. So I'm going to have to <laughs> do so that I've experienced it. And uh, what's the next one? Was there another well, one the next one would be Leica. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently Leica was um, sent here camera in 1958. That was Leica M3. So M3 was released in 1954. So let's have a look at those. That was... That one is a fun one, I think. No, that's, that's not like her. That's, that's not like her. But here we <laughs> have like thumbnails. They're too small. Here we have a like. So that's an M3, we're guessing. Yeah, I assume what's on top of it is some sort of light meter, but I could be wrong. I never use like in my life, so um, we uh, we are interested to see what it's like to shoot with Leicas for sure. But uh, but the opportunity has not yet <laughs> arisen. Yeah. Unfortunately. Well, maybe in October when they will reintroduce M6. Well, at least that's what rumors say. 
Yeah. Should we start a, a separate channel just for like a rumors? Yeah. <laughs> William says it's a selenium light meter. Ah, you okay. Go. Thank you so much. You um, can get those nowadays. The Voidlander makes like a cold shoe light meter and you can get those from TT Artisans as well. Because M3 yeah. itself is not metered. That's right. Yeah. I wonder... Yeah, that's that's a good point. I assume that that one was a was a Leica yeah. one that was especially made for it. If I'm not mistaken, the first metered Leica is M5. And then you got M6 and M7 was the first one to have aperture priority mode. So M3 would be unmetered. So yeah. yeah, which is why she would have the... And we know it's an M3 because somebody told me earlier that it was an M3. Um... Apparently, yeah, Roy said Nikon had similar add-on light meters. Uh, in fact, I think we've got one or two of them mm -hmm. lurking downstairs for, for early days. Range finders, I think, did they, they did one for for one of the range finders and then they mm -hmm. did one for the Nikon F. But anyway, oh yeah, and there's a slightly, there's a color version. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a different picture. It's a different picture, different but she's picture. still using them. Yeah, amazing. Uh, William actually has one of them. Nice. Very nice. Um, which Leica do you have, William? I'd like to know. <laughs> Just curious, really. I have none. <laughs> no, we have exactly zero Leicas. In our I was toying with the idea of getting an M5 because that's the cheapest one with a meter. That's the cheapest one with a meter. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of people say, well, just get M4 or M3, but I need a meter. I don't want to buy an attachment on top. It's just kind of takes away from the look. I understand. You know? I do understand. It makes it slightly less sleek. William's got an M3. Mm. He manages okay with a selenium light meter. I'm not as experienced <laughs> as him, but maybe one day. Tadius says his Western 5 still works. Yeah, I've got an old Western 2 uh, mm. that still works, believe it or not. So, I mean, I don't use it very often because all my cameras have meters in them now, uh, but it's it's kind of fun to have. The one with the dials and all that? Mm, yeah, it took me a, a hot minute to figure out how it works. You know, I used to work my whole life with the Sikonic light meters. How do you put it on so, like big screen? And then <laughs> it's the digital, it's a DJ boy. So, you know, um, so, you know, more than Sikonic light meters. Yeah. Well, not the touchscreen ones, but, the, you know, so when I got those old old fashioned Western ones, I can figure out how to use them. I mean, no. it's it's a bit different compared to like this watch type screens, you know. I actually had to. I remember when I did the SP video, which was kind of really just someone following me around while I used the SP and tried to figure out how it worked. Mm. Um, and I had the my Western Super Two Mark Two. And I had to look up the instruction manual because I couldn't figure it out. I was like, it's not working. <laughs> anyway, I got there eventually, managed to take some shots that were not completely terrible. But uh, but it's definitely, you you kind of become a little bit spoiled by having a meter built into your cameras, I think. Well, that's the thing, you know, when we discuss autofocus and all other things in the world, it's, yeah. you know, technology is there. I have to say, I could live you know. without autofocus. I can't live without a light meter. Yeah. I mean, what? but you were the one who was saying Sunny 16 always works for me. Yeah, I can. Yes, I can certainly do that. But I don't think it's a hard and fast rule. And it also depends on the latitude of your film and so mm. many different things. So um, also what tends to happen in England is that we have like yesterday, for example, we were out shooting in the morning. It was overcast. There were patches where the sun would come out. You wouldn't be able to just leave your camera on one setting in that situation. You have to keep changing. One minute it was very, very sunny. The next it looked like it was going to rain. It was real tough sort of balance yeah i think i saw override from like low 1.0 which is basically below 100 right to about 1400 iso depending on yeah if the sun was out or it was in the clouds that's right thankfully we were shooting digital so it wasn't too difficult oh you had you did bring your fm3a along. i did i did yeah mm. what film did you have in there uh port 400 nice you know i'm gonna finish that and i think i'm gonna hit that black and white i haven't shot black and white for probably Three, four years. Yeah, me neither. Um, and I was, originally I was a black and white guy. Yeah. You know, but then I don't know what happened. I just kind of went color. So, but I feel like it's time to come back. Yeah. You know, to just the roots. Full, full circle. I think we all do that at yeah. some point. Um, I've just read Fred's comment. I am so sorry, Fred, that, uh, I mean, what a horrible accident to have happened. I'm sorry, Fred. Um, but I hope that you're recovering well and uh, that you feel better and thank you for taking the time to join us uh, and hopefully we can bring a little bit of cheer to your Friday. Um, Nigel uses a Pentax digital spot meter. See, I want a fancy digital light meter, but they're quite expensive. Okay, I um, can tell you the um, 
with the Sikonic L758, if I'm not mistaken, their top one, not the color meter, but light meter. Yeah. So, because I was looking at it's, the price is supposed to be around 500, 550 pounds. Because mm. if you look at the secondhand spot meter, I think which is 458, it goes for about 450. So I thought, okay, I'll get a touchscreen one. Mm -hmm. It's going to last me for 20 years. The problem is, I looked at it about a year ago and they were out of stock, and they're still out of stock. Ah, like the Z9. Exactly. I have my um, stock alert set up on b &H in state, and um, they email me every two weeks to say there's a stock or not. Yeah. Still no stock. You can't get them. I don't know what's happening there, but you can't get those light meters. So you have to, if you want a sport meter, you have to pay eBay prices for the older models. Wow. Well. I'll if I actually ever decide to buy a digital light meter, I'll yeah. <laughs> come to you yeah. first. Tell I me mean, where the deals are at. You know the little ones, the Voigtlander, the cold shoe ones. Yeah. They're quite cute because they go on the hot shoe yeah. and that's all they do. They do just spot metering. Yeah. I mean they're not as advanced as Iconics, but technically, yeah, if you're shooting with something like SP or another Nikon range finder, or let's say like M3, that would be the one to choose. Yeah. My little Rolly B35 actually has a built-in selenium. Selenium, mm. is that how you pronounce it? Or selenium? Sorry, I've only ever read it. Selenium light meter mm -hmm. in the front of it, which I think makes it quite sort of um, almost like quite modern in that sense that it's got that meter and it doesn't need a mm -hmm. battery or anything, which is really handy as well. Um, That's incredible. Can they still repair those? No. No, okay. I mean, I did, mine's got basically the the wind on lever is disconnected somehow so when you load the film when you wind it on you don't actually know if you've loaded it correctly or not um and i got in touch with someone who was doing repairs and refurbs on it and the quote to repair it was about 700 quid and so it's probably cheaper to buy one used was, one on eBay. Yeah, yeah it Don't was go. cheaper to buy a new camera. But I like mine. So I'm just mm. going to live with it. Um, thank you so much, Fred, thank for your you, Fred. contribution to the Earl Grey Tea Fund. Um, that's really, really very kind of you. Um, Baxter said that touchscreen light meters chew through batteries, and that's the voice of experience. So mm. just so you know. Um, so Darth Sait said, is a light meter different from the exposure meter in your camera? I mean, sometimes people consider the light meter, an external light meter more accurate, apart from anything. But also if you're shooting, for example, with an older film body, the metering may be just a spot meter, whereas uh, an external light meter is going to give you a much broader metering yeah. and more accurate. And obviously if you use flash, non-metered flash, or studio lights, uh, studio flashes, then that's a right way to measure the light coming out of those flash guns. Um, and in terms of this, you know, obviously with digital now, you can take some test shots yeah. and do it this way. And that's what a lot of youngsters do nowadays. But in all days, especially when you shoot film, if you want to measure light coming out of your um, studio lights, that would be the way to do it. You would have a sync cable connect to your light meter, you would trigger them, and then you would set the, your settings on the camera because there's no other way to set it up with the camera because they're flashes, they're not continuous lights. Yes, precisely. Um... William said it was his dad's like M3. And then he said he should have bought a Nikon F. I mean, I don't know. Yes, because the Nikon F is iconic and beautiful, but trying to buy an M3 now is harder than buying a Nikon yeah, F, I, mean, I would say. I can agree they're both beautiful objects yeah. to hold and just even have on the shelf and admire them. You one know. of each. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't know where... David's comment came from, but uh, said you will love the 500 PF. The 500 PF is a great lens. I have used that for about the last three mm. years now, and uh, I'm a big fan. Although I will say I was um, speaking to someone the other day, and the 500 PF, completely changing the subject here from the topic, but the 500 PF works really nicely at close focusing distances. As soon as you go, start to shoot at infinity, it's not going to replace out a 500 F4, for mm. example, or something bigger. Um no, anyway. I can see Andy's in chat. Yes, hello, Andy. Congratulations no. on your hustle bar. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, I was randomly browsing Facebook groups, not the Facebook, the groups. <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a big difference. There is a big difference. And I can see Angie's post. She's got my hustle blood. Mm -hmm. haven't tested it yet because it's not a sunny weather. So I want to really hear your updates, by the way. Yes. So on how do, what's the quality is like on that 100 megapixel sensor? Yeah. Very nice. Um, all right. Now back to the topic at hand. Exactly. After Her Majesty was using her, her like M3 that we shared pictures of. Um, do we have any more pictures of that? Uh, we have a beautiful shot. Let me share that with you guys and girls. Here we go. It's actually just a lovely photograph, isn't it? Yeah. 
Um, but there she is, not actually shooting with the camera, but she's uh, but she's got it in her hands. So well, you, you never know. Said. Maybe it's a street photography style. So she pretends that she's not shooting, but she already set the focal distance. All she has to press is just shutter his button. Potentially. You know. Thank you so much, Deborah, for your contribution to the Thank conference. Thank you, Deborah. Very, very kind. Um, We've got, I mean, as when it comes to pictures of Her Majesty, we've actually got um, probably, I would say, one of the most well-known photographers. Um, there are obviously many royal photographers. There are many, many more than I can name. But one who is specifically a Nikon user is the uh, illustrious and very talented Mr. Julian Calder. Now, this photograph has been used um, quite a lot in recent times. And the incredible thing, and I think we've mentioned this before, this shot was obviously taken in Scotland. Um, Balma Estate. Yeah. Balamoral. Balmoral. And she was there in in that actual spot. In fact, in an issue of Nikon Owner from a couple of years back, I've got it here. We did a double cover. And although it's going to be really, really tiny, but that's okay. You don't need to see a close up. This was from 2013, this issue. And I think the picture was taken a little while before. But we did a double cover. The front cover here was just plain with Nikon owner on it. And then the back of it was actually uh, the normal Nikon owner cover that you would have with all the contents and stuff inside. But inside this issue, hold it up for the... The whole lighting setup. Yeah, can you, you can just about see that. We've got quite a big reflection of, the, of our lights, but you can see on this side, there she is in the field. And uh, that's a one massive reflector that Julian's assistant was using at the what time. What they call Soundbounce or something like this, that's the brand. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, some of you who are subscribers of the Nikon Auto Magazine, you can download that issue in PDF form. So you can log in and download it and read the article if you want to. You can. Um, and honestly, I mean, it's, it's just, it's an incredible shot. We've actually got, it was used on the front of one of Julian's books. This was from a couple of years ago. I think that this shot was taken for this book, although I'm not, uh, don't, Mm -hmm. That's true. But this is uh, one of his books. This was called Keepers. And uh, on the back, we have actually now the new Prince of Wales. That's Prince William there. It's hard to see on this one. But um, these books are generally still available online. You can still buy them. I'm going to show the other one as well. This one was called The Ancient Offices of Britain. Now, as I say, whether you're a royalist or not, the uh, monarchy has a huge, huge sort of historical element in this country. I mean, honestly, it's it's amazing some of the positions and titles that people have because they work in and around the royal family. And uh, there's a great legacy. You know, we've been ruled by monarchs for over a thousand years. <laughs> you know, just bear with us if you don't uh, if you don't think much of it. I don't. Uh, then, you know, go and look at another stream or something. But this book is full of images of people who are actually keepers of um, the royal estate or various different offices in the royal family. Uh, and then the other book that Julian Calder brought out recently, sorry, what am I saying? Uh, which, interestingly enough, he brought out specifically for the Platinum Jubilee, uh, but is probably even more historical now, was called Queens in Their Name. And it was all of the various different offices that people have where their job title, if you like, is Queens something or other. So this one, let me find it. Uh, I have to find the the name. There's there's a couple of really obscure ones here, but you have things like Queens Piper. Uh, she had a Piper. Queens Gurkha Orderly Officers. You know, Queen's Page of Honour in Scotland. There's all, all kinds of ones in there. So anyway, that's a very historical piece, but there's some incredible photos in there, all of which were shot on Nikon, I'd add. So there is some Nikon in this live stream. I think it was D3X at the time, wasn't it? Some of it was D3X. Or was it D800? Sure. D, uh, well, he uses a D850 now. Yes. I don't know. I think Julian went picture. through pretty much all D800 series, and then he had D3X before that. All the high resolution bodies, yeah. basically, because when, and he definitely did use a D3X as well, because when you are taking pictures of an individual like that, then uh, you need the highest resolution you can possibly get, basically. Yeah, hopefully Z8 will be the same, but we're not gonna go there. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about that, uh, because although the Z8 is a topic that everybody wants to talk about, we're not going to talk about it here. No, today. no Z8, Z8, Z8 talk mm -hmm. today. 
Uh, thank you very much to Joy for your contribution thank to you, the Joy. Earl Grey Fund. Um, Norm said, I understand that the NASA astronauts left some Hasselblad cameras on the moon. Mm -hmm. They're free for anyone who wants to go and pick them up. Yeah, imagine just selling those on eBay. We were... <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting that we're using Hasselblad. Obviously, Nikons were used by NASA. Uh, Nikon F3 was was a NASA camera um, mm. and was uh, taken up there. I don't know where specifically, but uh, but interesting. I'll call my mate Elon. Yeah, call him and see if he can go and fetch those Hasselblad. Exactly. For you. Thank you very much to Darth Sate. Thank you very much. Uh, for your super chat and to Randall as well. Thank you, Randall. Um, now, Randall says that Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip visited San Antonio, Texas in 1991. Favorite online picture taken of her was when she was riding the riverboat with our mayor downtown in the Riverwalk area. It's probably some pretty cool pictures from, mm -hmm. from some of those tours. Um, now, Dave. This is very ambitious of you, Dave. Dave says, planning to do a bit of a morning after shoot around Westminster on Tuesday before I get my train to the NEC for the photo show. So we're going to be at the photography show on Tuesday. Yes. So Dave, we might see you there. Photography show will be closed on Monday. Just keep that in mind. Yes. Yeah. Um, and anything. it's opening tomorrow. And it's opening tomorrow. So for our overseas viewers, if you like, the photography show is usually held every September. La obviously during COVID, it was all online, but then last year we had the first kind of comeback one and it was quite small, but it was nice to see people in person. Um, and this year it's gonna be quite a bit bigger from what I understand, but obviously we'll be closed for the funeral on Monday. So we'll yeah. be there on Tuesday. If you're coming, just if you will be the ones holding a gimbal. That's true. That's true. Production-wise, it's going to be a busy week next week. It is. It is for us. Um, <laughs> I don't know what that means, Sam. But anyway, Sam said, speaking of obscure titles, I was chief peasant to the mayor recently. I think, see, we have a lot of history in England. <laughs> so there's uh, there's an awful lot uh, of weird sort of odd things. I mean, there are things like, you know, the Royal Duck Keeper and stuff like mm. that that exist still. Um so that's interesting. Please do elaborate when you have a moment. Now, let's have a look. John's going to be there tomorrow. We won't be there tomorrow, unfortunately, but we will be there on Tuesday. Uh, Nick asking the important questions here said, do you think Nikon will ever make a rangefinder style Z mount camera with a built in EVF? I predict that a full frame will come out first. Before something. Before any like rangefinders, yeah. 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 I mean, rangefinder, digital rangefinder is an odd one well it's not like makes them i know but for nikon nikon yeah. who consider themselves a mainstream brand that's true it's it's odd they're more likely to follow on yeah from I, what I, other I mean brands they've abandoned use. them something around 1960s i think 1959 maybe i'm wrong but uh, they haven't done any range find there's a part of the reissues the 2000 reissue of a spns3 yeah so in terms of this i yeah I, I doubt but i would love them to do that that's for sure yeah, it would uh, it would be yeah. one that we would definitely get a lot of good mm -hmm. use out of. Um, now, Andy said he's updating later today. What does that mean? Is Hasselblad talk? I don't yes, know. yes. So um, <laughs> Andy's got a Hasselblad. So, I, I realize and, that um, much. I want to know all about it. Yeah, yeah. So we're waiting to we're waiting to hear your update. I want to know about color science more than anything else. That's what really 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 yes. interests you. It's interesting that modern equipment has has such different kind of look and feel, but the technical word is color science. Mm. And different camera brands produce different types of images and everything. I suppose that's that's why the Queen used film because it was consistent. <laughs> Wow. I've got it all sussed <laughs> you, out there. Got it all I've got out. it all figured out. Exactly. That's what we should say. The Queen used film. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Do we have any other? Um, I don't know if we do have any other pictures of her well, using cameras. I think how about, we ran through How them. about a Z, uh, M6? Oh, an M6. There we go. The classic, okay. which is rumored to be reintroduced again. Yes. So if, uh, if anyone has the M6 and is thinking of... <laughs> selling it for cheap to me then <laughs> definitely i got about 500 pounds yeah okay good ebay price is about two and a half you might be able to buy a if you feel charitable to camera me. strap lug for exactly. that much or maybe like a, a i'm trying to think of something or a cap for the lens <laughs> well the interesting thing about this whole rumor about m6 is they saying it's supposed like if the rumors are true mm -hmm. Well, it could be a limited edition of something, who knows, which is going to cost 
you know, Lenny Kravitz edition, £25,000. Yes. But it could be a cheaper version of current MA and MP cameras, which I in UK are close to £4,500. Yeah. Brand new. They're still made. Shocking. So the second-hand prices of M6 is at the moment going from 2000 to 3000 pounds, but two to two and a half, that's a going rate on eBay if you're looking at overinflated eBay prices. Yeah. So if they introduce something at something like two and a half, three K, that will drop the prices of the M6s. That's where I come in mm -hmm. and buy a second-hand one. You swoop in with your 500 pounds. Exactly. Probably have to use my, my Z8 fund for that, but, um, you know. Yes. Well... Considering that by the time the Z8 comes out, you might have saved it. Exactly, once, exactly. Once Sacrifices sometimes have to be made. That's right. Um, Roy argues that film has never been consistent. I suppose that's that's true. It can be a little bit inconsistent. Uh, it definitely depends a lot also on your chemistry and your scanning methods or yeah. your printing methods, depending on how you how you function. So yes, yeah. it's it's very true. But Roy has never been about logic with human beings. That's the thing about this. No. You know, no. because yes, we would also digitally listen to flock music, you know, and all that, and we'll be digitized. But, you know, technically a piece of paper is inferior, you know, to yeah. Word document. So <laughs> it's never been logical with human beings. And if you, you know, choose to do that and go through, you know, all... Potential pain. <laughs> Like, it's mostly pain, isn't it? So until you see actual shot and then you're like, you see results it was all worth it. Like. Exactly, exactly. So it's never been about logic at all. The same as the argument about auto focus with manual focus cameras. Yeah. It's never been about logic. It's just some people like to do this and they're fine with it. As simple as that. That's right. Uh, David said, uh, you, yes, use film and stop worrying about updates. Um, other David says film is not dead. And Bob said colors are all over the place. Roy said, especially with expired film. So well, well, that's the thing. When 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 something like film causes this reaction from people, they've become reactive and they need to say how negative they're towards film. Yeah. Um, there is something there that I don't understand. That's the thing. It's the same like, yeah, when you say like a vinyl thing and there's like, oh, MP3 or something. Well, look, if people made this choice for themselves, it doesn't mean they kind of shove it in your face. No. If you see what I mean. So they, they like this, they enjoy it. And that's what it is. But... You know, you're welcome through digital, enjoy digital. It's as simple as that. We should both. We do. And we enjoy, we, we have, we choose cameras for different projects, depending on the needs. It depends yeah. on the feeling of the day, I think. It's nice to be able to have the choice as well. Obviously, exactly, exactly. You know, some, some people are only going to be able to run one camera at a time. And film is sadly so expensive. I mean, not yeah. just the purchasing of the physical film, but the developing as well can be quite expensive. And mm -hmm. it does add up if you look at sort of cost per shot. We did have this interesting argument, uh, argument's not the word, I'd say discussion with the, with the guys and gals at Analog Wonderland about which method of photography was more sustainable, film or digital. Mm. And they were saying because of the way that digital cameras are produced and the fact that they kind of go obsolete very quickly, et cetera, et cetera, they considered that film cameras and shooting film was more sustainable than digital. But I, I truly don't know. You have to find a way to... Uh, recycle those film canisters. They're, they're doing a whole project on that, actually. So if anyone wants old, empty film canisters for an art installation or something like that, they are very glad to rehome those. Uh, and I really, really love their sort of sustainability message when it comes yeah. to film. But also chemistry is not particularly sustainable. But it's interesting to see, I've looked into the chemistry, and actually chemistry has been replaced mm. almost every year to be more ecologically friendly. So the chemistry that you use now for processing is very different than it was even 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So they do find those interesting, you know, uh, like the substitutes effectively. So, you know, it's happening, they're looking say, so yeah, if, if it would be, you know, if you, as you say, like some people say, like I burned my eyes with the chemistry, like, yeah, you don't, you're not going to have this. No. Um, David says different shoes for different occasions, just like cameras. No, but if you shoot digitally, it's absolutely fine. That's yeah. the thing. It's b b b that's that's my point. When people say, "Oh, this is wrong," instead of enjoy that's what right. you're doing, enjoy. you know, uh, that's that's what kind of you know um, makes people. Well, what's the difference? I mean, we talk about inclusivity, like you know, in like in general in society. So you know, let people do whatever they want. And photography Include is not about photography. The, exactly. Photography is not about latest technology. If a person enjoys taking a photograph with a shoebox and he made pink hole camera out of it, and that's only the use, it's absolutely fine. And if you have your latest camera with, you know, 
billion megapixels and you spend 20,000 pounds on it, it's absolutely fine. And everything in the middle. That's right. And yeah. um, pinhole camera with the shoebox is my next challenge. <laughs> it's fun. It's a fun challenge. I can I recommend this. I haven't yeah. done it. Um, Nick says, my old film canisters are great for carrying my coins. Still occasionally use cash. That's yeah, you have really it. cool, you know, actually. Some like... people use their cameras as door stoppers. You know, you never know. <laughs> no, but I like the idea of using a film canister yeah. to put coins in. Uh, so that's very, very interesting. What size is it? Is it like 20p? I guess uh, it must be. Well, pound coins would fit. Pound, in there. yeah, fifty people not going to fit too, nice. Too big. Okay. Yeah, but um, see, Terry said I small. I store small screws, etc., in my old canisters and coinage. So you know, there's people actually using them for purposes like that. I think that's great. Um, as I say, if you do have any projects or anything that you um, need film canisters for, then Analog Wonderland. You can just contact them. Yeah. They're always happy to ship a box of, of empty film canisters. Well, actually, people spool their own film. Yeah. They're buying, like, you know, Vision 500C, which is Kodak uh, Cinema Film, um, and uh, they just spool them into the canister. So you can buy 100 feet and 400 feet, you know, rolls. Nice. So, you know, you could, if you need the extra spare canisters, give them a call. Yeah. Uh, David Bransma said, I had recent interest in film by younger photographers uh, and hard to get film on a regular basis. It's true. Uh, Grace does stock film, just for anyone who's mm. looking for it. In fact, you just got a delivery of what was it? Yeah, we've got, we've got uh, Fujifilm 200, which is a new version of C200 film. So that just arrived, small commodity, but they're here. Yeah, and I will say I shot, while I was away, because I didn't have any Kodak Portra left, I shot with um, Lomography 100, which is potentially another brand rebadged by Lomography. We don't know for sure. Um, but in terms of colors and, re you know, just the general kind of overall quality of that film, I was shooting on a half frame camera, so I mm -hmm. can't vouch for the quality of the lens on that one. But definitely in terms of colors, I was really pleased with it. It didn't look that far off, um, probably... Not, it's not portrait yeah. 60, but there is another low ISO film. That could be something like yeah, a gold or Ultramax or something like yeah, this. So uh, exactly. Pro Image could be as well. But it's if you're looking at just a normal film from Lomography, because obviously Lomography started as a kind of, you know, analog Instagram type That's of right. films, like you know, special fun effects. filter film. Yeah, yeah, Metropolis, Red Scale, you name it. Um, but if you're looking at a normal film from Lomography, a Lomography 100, 400 and 800 film, that would be... No one knows who, who they use. It's probably 99% Kodak, and it would be one of those consumer films in there. Yeah, and uh, I will say that's at the moment pretty generally available, and I was very pleased with the results. So mm -hmm. there are ways to kind of ways around it if you can't get your favorite film. And I think film photography is, is very much more about experimentation than it is necessarily about... Uh, I mean, it's obviously also about taking the picture, but doing it in such a way that you don't know what result you're going to get is part of the joy. <laughs> For me, it's about mindfulness. Yeah. I would say more than anything else. It just that keeps me calm. Slows you, you know. down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's like, I, you know, I'll have a commercial job, I'll take my digital camera, and I'll use all the latest technology. And it's there, and it's perfect for that. And you'll feel a exactly. deep panic every exactly. time. Exactly. <laughs> but I don't okay. need to be super technical when I'm in the field and taking a you know landscape that is for me. You know, I'm not a you know I'm not a landscape photographer. No. You know, so I can enjoy just using what I want. Exactly. Exactly that. Although I do love that there are um, professional photographers that use yeah. film as their sort of stock in trade, bread and butter. I'm going to shoot film. True. Uh, synthetic color, which David David is using, film, yeah, that's true. A, a digital long side film, but but uh, very much a lot of film cameras. You pretty much got all the Nikons, right? Like uh, the film Nikons, like yeah. F3, F4, F5, F6? I don't know. Not yeah. three about F6. I can't remember now. Yes, I think so. I mean, it's been used David, as, yeah. tell us all the cameras that you have. I mean, have. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm watching your <laughs> stories on Instagram, so it's yeah, quite fascinating. It yeah. is. Uh, Nigel made a pinhole camera out of a Lego box. Oh, I like that idea. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a few of those. Also made my own pinhole and then shot on Ilford paper. Mm -hmm. uh, David, uh, Dave Walker's going to look out for us. It will be a long day, and we're also going to have to be in the office on Wednesday. So yes, it's going to be a bit tiring. Uh, it's going to be very tiring. In fact, we also have a Nikon report to put out somehow. Yeah, we, we're there on Tuesday. We're recording the report on Wednesday and then I'm editing it basically on Thursday and hopefully I can get it out by the evening. And then on Friday, we're back for the live stream. So Yay. And in the meantime, I have to edit the video that we're filming at the NEC so that it comes out by Sunday. So that's good. Sounds like fun. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like next week's going to be interesting for us. Speaking of which, we're going to film everything what we mentioned on digital cameras. Yes. 
<laughs> and we'll use all the latest technology. Yeah. Not on film. That's right. Maybe we should do a YouTube video on film. That's going to be expensive. <laughs> that would be really tough. At 24 frames per second. Yeah. I, could, uh, I can't see that going down very well. So imagine if we mess it up. And then imagine having to record audio separately. <laughs> don't don't go there. Let's spend about a thousand pounds mm -hmm. on one on one video. On one video. Yeah. Uh, and what are we going to do a video of? That's the question. The fact that we're about that nine. About something digital. That's <laughs> crazy. Uh, Baxter said I had a film camera with me on a project shoot last week. Complimented the digital medium format. Nice. Mm. Um, I definitely. I think that having a, a film camera for certain professional shoots alongside your digital camera, if you don't want to use it exclusively, is a really nice way to kind of add an extra element. I know a number of wedding photographers that will take a film camera and shoot. Yeah. They'll make sure they have film as well as digital. Um, a lot of fashion photography mm -hmm. and uh, lifestyle photography, editorial photography is being shot on film. That's right. And generally people would have two cameras on the set. One pro digital camera and then one, let's say, medium format camera. Although I have to say the thing that really winds me up is when uh, very well-known brands will put out images and they'll include... Shot on digital. Shot and on the, digital yeah. and then they put like, you know, it's a color picture, but they put Ilf HP5. <laughs> they put yeah. Triax or exactly, yeah. or it's a black and white shot, really, yeah. really digitally noisy and they've put portrait <laughs> on the side. That annoys me. That's true. Um Anyway, we uh, we basically have we we did we show the pictures, pictures of M6? Oh, I didn't. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you did. Just yeah, I did. Picture yeah, of M6. okay. Let's Was just there put another it again. picture of M6? Yeah. Was so there let's just do one? that. And let me find if I can Is find another one. Is it the one at the top there? Yeah. Yeah. Let's have a look at there that. There we go. That's our that's our Close last up. last picture of the day. So. Um, so thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Those of you who had stories, thank you for sharing your stories. It's been um, a lovely afternoon. Honestly, if you are planning on coming into town over the next couple of days, I understand it's going to be pretty hectic. As I say, the queues are eight to ten hours, um, but you can sort of wander around Green Park area if yeah. that's of interest, if you feel like you need that in order to, uh, you know, pay your yeah. respects and... But keep in mind that TFL issued warnings as well. They say it's going to be busy. It's going to be probably uh, closures of the um, stations around the area as well. So West Minster, Embankment stations, Temple probably, et cetera, et cetera. So, so just keep in mind and plan your trip accordingly. Exactly. And in the meantime, we ish wish you all a wonderful weekend and uh, week ahead. You will be getting updates from us probably via Instagram when uh, we're back on Tuesday, tracking up the intrepid adventurers that we are all the way up to Birmingham to the photography show. Uh, wish us the best of luck. But anyway, we, we send our very best to you all. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Bye. All right. And now I need to figure out how to...